Hello, St. James. I hope that you are doing well and that your Lent is off to a good start. Uh, and uh, as I said on Ash Wednesday, I say again, I hope you use this time to, uh, uh, to do what you need uh, to, to fill your, your spiritual batteries uh, and to, to gird yourself for the season that we're in. Um, it is a holy time and it's a uh, reflective time, uh, but it is definitely a season that you need uh, to put on uh, or take off what it is that you need uh, for for you to be sustained in your faith. So I hope that's what uh, what you're doing for yourself. And uh, to that end, I very much appreciated the daily meditations uh, contributed by uh, fellow members of the church uh, and uh, continue to, to be on the lookout for those. Uh, either go directly to the website or uh, you can follow the link in the weekly email um, that will have the link for all of them uh, or uh, on social media, uh, there should be a, a daily reminder that they're out there. So different ways to uh, uh, to stay connected through that. Also, our adult formation committee started their discussion of mere Christianity today. Uh, depending on when you're watching this, either uh, it, it will happen at nine o'clock or it has happened at nine o'clock. Uh, but they haven't started discussing the the text of the book yet. Uh, um, this was just an uh, introduction. So next week uh, is the first week where you have a reading assignment. So uh, you can follow along and uh, they'd love to have you on the conversation. It really is a, a, a wonderful group and a wonderful support. So please uh, consider that. Uh, also, our Lent um, to-go bags are that Jen Taylor put together for families are uh, still available uh, and can be found outside of uh, the school entrance. So uh, please consider that as well. And uh, and know that we're here for you. Uh, anything that you need to help uh, sustain you during this season, we would, would gladly uh, offer. And I do have some encouraging news. Uh, the diocese uh, has, uh, has said that we are uh, in the range where we are able to resume having services outdoors as soon as the weather uh, allows. And uh, we are getting ever closer uh, to the new, uh, the, new st the, the new benchmark for uh, returning to indoor worship. So, uh, so be, uh, be on the lookout, but if the numbers continue to go in the right direction, uh, we could be in this space uh, sooner than later, which is, is wonderful news. So, uh, so with that, we begin our service. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Okay. His mercy endures forever. We miss you, St. James. We're happy to be with you today, but we wish we could see you in person. Take care of each other. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weakness of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, St. James. I hope this Sunday morning finds you safe and warm following whatever wintry mix you've sustained over the past couple of weeks. Hopefully, spring is just around the corner and with it all the warmer weather. February 21st, 2021, Prayers for the People. Let us pray. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Joseph, our President, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement, for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us towards sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. 
I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially Barbara, Linda, Lloyd, Maggie, Becky, Ellsworth, Paula, Ruby, Tom, Pat, Ansel, Patty, Tina, Kay, and Marie. And for all Americans across the nation dealing with power outages, cold, lack of food and water as a result of the recent spate of storms. We offer prayers now for those whom we name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all health care and emergency workers, for those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and for those facing economic and food insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died, whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God for the faithful and growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together. Embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son who came and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So when I was in high school, we were reading Great Expectations, and I remember as we were almost done the book, uh, the teacher just kind of offhandedly said, uh, you know, Charles Dickens was paid by the word. And all of a sudden, I, it registered with me because it made a lot of sense having, having just finished uh, the book or almost finished the book. I can assure you that the gospel writer Mark was not paid by the word. And if he had been, he would have died a very, very poor man. He was remarkably judicious with his words. So much so that the gospel that we have for today uh, is three stories sort of bound together by the church uh, so that we would have a fulsome enough uh, gospel to share with you this morning. Uh, Normally on the first Sunday of Lent, we would talk about uh, the the, the narrative of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by the devil. that's given one, maybe two sentences in Mark's gospel. So we, we tape it uh, to the story of Jesus' baptism. And then on the other side, we tape it to Jesus beginning his ministry in Galilee. So we have those three stories all bound together. Um, and I have to say, I've found it especially appropriate this year. Not just because this land is not like uh, years past, but because of conversations I've had with many of you. You know, as a liturgist, 
My inclination during this season when we're able to come together uh, is to start with that penitential rite, to move the confession of sin uh, to the very beginning of the service during Lent. Uh, so it, it, it centers us uh, on that responsibility that we have during this season uh, to really take stock of our lives. And so we confess those sins and thought, word, and deed, things done, things left undone. We ask for forgiveness. Wow. Now, I've mentioned before that I find the confession and the absolution to be one of the most liberating parts of the service, one of the most honest um, parts. And, and uh, I used to find it incredibly heavy, and now I, 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 I complete it, and there's a lightness that wasn't there before. But I often haven't appreciated whether or not other people feel the same way. What about those who come in uh, to, the, to the church for the first time? Maybe coming in because they're a court low, uh, coming in because uh, of some, fragile, some fragile aspect of their lives, uh, something that feels unworthy, unlovable. How do they hear those words, those acknowledgement of sin? How does the person who sat there in the pew their whole lives feel about it. I think I can describe it as a moment of lightness, as a release of burden, as a moment of uh, profound honesty, because I start at the same place that Jesus starts his ministry. It is always wrapped up in that baptismal moment, that first story. So remember, when Jesus goes to be baptized, uh, one, Jesus has no reason to be baptized. It was sort of a, uh, a, a cleansing bath, uh, uh, like as if sin were dirt that you just wash off. Uh, and, uh, and John had his followers, and Jesus had his, and so uh, he almost uh, lays himself under John by saying, you baptize me. And in fact, John tries to, uh, uh, to turn the tables and say, no, I'm not worthy. Uh, but Jesus enters into the waters. He submerges himself, saturates himself in all of our sin, all the things uh, that we want washed off us. And as he comes out of the water, the skies open up and the voice of God says, you are my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased, with whom my soul delights. And Jesus does that because all of us have that as our starting point. Not just Jesus, all of us are God's beloved, God's child with whom God delights, with whom God is well pleased. And that is our unconditional origin story. That is our starting point. And when we start there, then confronting our sin becomes a moment of liberation, becomes a moment of honesty with somebody we trust and know that our identity is forever, indelible, absolute. Our worthiness is absolute. And so we start with Jesus' baptism, and then he is sent out into the wilderness to be tempted, and he's tempted with all the things that the world can give us, all the things we measure ourselves against. Are we worthy in the standards the world has set? Are we wealthy? Are we powerful? And he's even tempted with how much do we trust in God? And so as Jesus faces those temptations, I imagine he had to hold on tightly to that truth. That truth. Regardless of your sin, regardless of what the world tells you you are or you aren't, you, in that baptism, were claimed as God's beloved, with whom God is well pleased, with whom God's soul delights. And then he's sent to Galilee to do that work, girded for the work that needs to happen, focused on the cross, carrying that truth, that indelible truth with him so that he can center himself to walk lovingly towards that ultimate emptying of his love of himself on the cross. Now, I mentioned I've been reading Bishop 
Curry's Love is the Way, and, um, and it details essentially his whole life, but especially uh, his ordained life. And uh, he talks about his time uh, before he was called to be Bishop of North Carolina when he was in Baltimore at an uh, African-American church in downtown Baltimore. And the church was in a, a neighborhood uh, that was not inhabited by any of the congregation. The congregation had long since moved out of that uh, neighborhood. They lived uh, uh, several neighborhoods away and uh, closer to the suburbs, uh, but they would still commute into this church because this church had a long-standing history and a, a very proud reputation uh, and had lifted up uh, uh, wonderful leaders in the community and beyond. Uh, and the church also had a really strong, uh, a very vibrant social life, had more guilds than any church uh, Bishop Curry had experienced. Uh, and those guilds knew how to throw a party. Uh, they had each guild seemed to compete for the best Christmas party. And, uh, and as Curry soaked up the church, he realized it was a church where the members benefited. You know, they say the church is the only place that you join so that others could benefit. But that's not necessarily the way that the church was operating there. There were a few lay leaders that, uh, that Curry could see were, were, were starting to realize we can't be a social club. We have to be an agency for good in this community. He describes some of those uh, folks that uh, that wanted to do more, uh, folks that started a, a, a school and tutoring program uh, for uh, uh, for neighborhood children. Uh, they talked about uh, the the church going and singing carols, uh, and um, a, a homeless uh, a person uh, who wouldn't reveal himself, uh, hidden behind some trash cans, uh, joining in the chorus of of, of Silent Night. These little glimmers of light. But he also described some of the heartbreak of being in that neighborhood, of, of having to uh, console a mother as they uh, laid uh, to rest uh, her son uh, because of the drug pan uh, epidemic that was, uh, that was really wreaking havoc in that neighborhood. And the church had to commit, are we going to be in this neighborhood for good? For good. or are we gonna to move to the suburbs? And this was challenged greatly when there was a, a, a lightning that struck the, uh, the, the tower and, uh, and the roof had burned. And somebody even asked that night as they were staring at this, uh, at, at this uh, church, this beautiful stone church, one of the few beautiful, uh, beautiful edifices, uh, hope-filled edifices left in this neighborhood, are you moving to the suburbs? And Curry, knowing that he had the support of his congregation, said, we are here. We're here to stay. And not long after that, uh, somebody came in to visit him. And he knew the person. Uh, he recognized him as uh, one of the neighborhood drug dealers. And he was pretty standoffish. But the person came to him and he said, I can't do this anymore. I want to change. Curry pressed him a little bit, and he said, I want to get out of this drug dealing. I, I want to get out. And Curry still struggled to see what God sees in each one of us. He still uh, struggled because in the back of his head, uh, there were thoughts. Is this the person that caused this mother that I had to console her infinite and, 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 and permanent deep grief? Is this the person? But after a conversation, the drug dealer asked if he could come back next week and kept his appointment, showed up on time. And, and, and eventually they were, were meeting weekly uh, as, um, as, uh, and as they discussed uh, this person's life and this person's history, this person's history with, uh, with, uh, with a troubled childhood, uh, his, his lack of any relationship with his dad, and, and so many of the other things uh, that led him to where he was. Uh, finally, the gentleman said, tell me about Jesus. And Curry was sort of shocked. 
you realize that you've been meeting with this person for four weeks, six weeks, uh, and this uh, priest, this person who wrote a whole book about how, uh, how critical Jesus had been in every step of his life, had not once mentioned Jesus uh, to this person. Wasn't quite sure this person had much use for Jesus. Maybe, in a point of judgment, wasn't quite sure whether Jesus had much use for this person. But he began teaching him about Jesus and began opening up scripture. And he said that in that discovery, he was discovering Jesus all over again. He was discovering that image of God that claims that truth that exists for all of us. This is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased, with whom my soul delights. He said, ultimately, this young man asked him, will you baptize me? Will you baptize me? Curry said he's never, ever wept at a baptism. The way he wept as he laid his hands, as he marked this child of God, as sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. And he knew the cost. He knew that publicly being baptized would have consequences to this person in this particular neighborhood. That he really would have to think a little bit more about what it means when we make those renunciations. Do you renounce Satan and all of the forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Do you renounce them? Do you accept Christ as your savior? In baptism, we acknowledge that truth. That we are God's beloved, with whom God is well pleased. And when we do that, we can start confronting things like our own sinfulness, our own brokenness, the way that evil has permeated our lives. And we can walk a little bit more closely along that path that leads to the cross, beyond the cross, to the essence of God and God's love for us. Amen. Jesus walked, yes, he walked. Jesus walked that lonesome valley for me. Don't you know Jesus walked? My yes, Jesus, he walked. My Jesus, Jesus walked that lonesome valley for me. Jesus walked that lonesome Jesus for the cross for sin.
sinners, yes, for sinners like you and me. Don't you know Jesus walked? Remember that life is short. We have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and the blessing of God Almighty, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our worship is now ended and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.